Here we are with Off Topic, Savage Worlds. Thoughts? I am Devin. And Peter. And we're in May 2018, listeners. And if you hear music in the background, that's because we have music going on in the background. Calm music. <laughs> um, we'll just adjust that. Also, you might hear interference in the background. Summer's here, so one window is perpetually open and covered in a garbage bag for the air conditioner vent. That's just how we live now, because it gets to like plus 40 here in Vancouver. We're still in Canada. It's not that cold. I mean, it gets bad. Thank you, Ronald Reagan. So, uh, over the past little while, we ran two games in Savage Worlds. Uh, one was the first season of Ravenloft, The Conspiracy at Kresik, which we played in Vanilla Savage Worlds, and we used the Ravenloft Reincarnated free book hosted on the Fraternity of Shadows site, um, which I think we've already linked at this point, so folk can check that out. Yep. Um, we also ran a sillier game called Rifts vs. The Star Wars. Which, if you're listening to this off-topic listeners, both of those shows have already been out and been completed for, I'm hazarded, a few months now. This will probably be June, July, July, August-ish that you hear this, listeners. Yeah. We, we record things ahead of time. Yeah, we, we make a backlog. If you podcast, <coughs> you, you want a backlog, listeners. Uh, so in Star in Rifts vs. the Star Wars, we used Savage Worlds, and then we used the Savage Rifts supplement uh, made by Pinnacle. Which the Tomorrow's Legion? Yeah, the Tomorrow Legion's Guide. Uh, Rifts is Rifts. I'm sure you know. And uh, yeah, I guess Peter uh, brought it up to me. He wanted to do an off-topic for Savage Worlds, just to kind of, you know, do a send-off to it. Because I'm not sure we're going to come back to the Savage World system. We have an awful lot of systems in our queue, listeners. Like if we get time to record it all, it'd be a few years worth of content. So we just don't. Uh, I just don't think there's a reason for us to come on back to it. Yeah, so I wanted to record our thoughts on the system and give their last, I don't know, maybe notes on the Star Wars story that we might never finish. Oh, we're definitely not finishing that Star Wars story. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we finished that Attack of the Clones. We ended on the high note, the best movie in the franchise. Remember uh, Attack of the Clones? A little before the you know, Han Solo story, so maybe. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, Han Solo might fucking knock Attack of the Clones out of the water. It's the best Star Wars movie ever made. It was only 90% reshot by the fucking guy from the Andy Griffith show. As you may tell, you're being sarcastic. Yes, obviously, listeners. No one likes Attack of the Clones. Not even you, the person who's like, well, I did. You don't. That's, you're just wrong. You like a lot of other things more than Attack of the Clones. Anyway, Savage Worlds. So Savage Worlds came out a while ago. I didn't check the copyrights on it or anything. It came out a while ago, and it was based on a game called Deadlands, I think, which um, is where the card initiative system came from, and the miniatures, and, you know, knocking them over if they get wounded, and stuff, if you're shaken. 2003. 2003, holy Christ. So that was 15 years ago. Yeah. So yeah, this game definitely feels as made for miniatures, because everything is miniature size, where Inches, blast templates. Yeah, where you have range in the units for the miniatures, which one unit of range corresponds to like two yards or something, because... And what the fuck's a yard? It's like a meter. Just say meters, <coughs> just go metric. Maybe That's not really its fault. It, you can't blame an RPG from 2003 from not going metric like the rest of the planet. <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, Savage Worlds came out in 2003. Uh, it uh, was based on Deadlands, which was a supernatural Wild West style world. Uh, it's pretty neat. I've read through a little bit of it, like the briefest bit of it. Um, and there's a lot of material from Deadlands that made people go, hey, you can use this system for other things. And it became kind of its own system. And it has a, quite a bit of supplements out for it. Like there's, I don't know, I think I counted like 20, 30 books when I was giving a perusal to it. Um, you know, superheroes, sci-fi, horror, investigation, um... World War One and Two. War, the World Wars, um, there was one for doing, like, superheroes in, um, what do you call it, Victorian times, like League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. You know, there's 
they've been putting out content and they have their license settings. Like uh, recently, very recently, uh, probably just the, the cusp of these videos coming out, they did Flash Gordon, um, which was like Kickstarter and everything. And right now uh, they're also doing a, a G.I. Joe style world as well. And of course, Rifts, which of all the properties <coughs> you're going to license out, Rifts is the one no one would fucking expect. Um, Uncle K, as he's called, Special K, <laughs> as he's known in our hearts, is awfully protective of licensing out the Palladium stuff to other systems. So the fact that th these guys were able to do that is, um, that's, that's no small feat. That, that deserves to go down in infamy somewhere in RPG history. The time a generic, uh, basically, uh, it's not a slight, the time, the time a generic system got to do a licensed Rifts run, that's fucking nuts. Yep. Um, so yeah, I guess that's backstory. I don't know what else we could say about uh, Savage Worlds as far as like context goes. Well, it's definitely got a very diverse set of rules you just plug in and use for your settings. Like. Yeah, it's very much a traditional game or a trad game as the uh, the hot lingo is these days. You know, it has a very front-loaded action system, which is primarily fighting, like murder combat. Yep. Um, it has driving, it has chases, um, There, there's a skill system in the background and such for, like, dealing with non-combat things. Uh, but it's very much an action game. It's very much in the vein of, you know, swinging on chandeliers, sword fighting as, like, you know, the Three Musketeers or what have you. Yep. It, it feels like it. Um, to that extent, they say that there's a, a brand new rebuild coming out called Savage Worlds Black, which they're apparently taking a lot of the technology they've developed over the different books and making that the default for it when it comes out. So, like, um, uh, Flash Gordon has different... Um, I don't remember any of them now. I don't remember a goddamn one. I was reading about it just a few minutes ago, and I didn't prep any of this. I'm just speaking from my heart. Um, but yeah, it, rules updates. They're no longer doing the miniatures measurement thing. Yeah. Um, iconic frameworks, kind of what Savage Rift started. Uh, that seems to be cropping up more in other books. Like, I know the, the superhero one and the um, G.I. Joe one, they're starting to take advantage of a similar type of kit creation for making iconic-looking characters. So all these little quality of life improvements they've made over the years is going to probably be in the newer edition, which, that's fine. 15 years down the road and, and a very prolific scheduling and publishing system means people got a lot of time to, like, think up new, better ways to do it and put it into a book. Um, that's one of the advantages of uh, Power by the Apocalypse right now. Power by the Apocalypse is fairly recent, and it has, last I checked, 90 uh, derivatives. Not, not from the creator, derivatives things that other people did that they post on their website mm -hmm. like that's just the ones on the website that doesn't even count the stuff that never got there uh so in that very short amount of like playtime um power by the apocalypse has gotten a bunch of leaps in like design and evolution uh like power uh, blades in the dark um and the way it does clocks and the way it does gangs and the way it kind of runs its game it did a bunch of stuff very differently and it changed a lot of things and that was like considered a net positive, and now that's being taken and put into the new generation of games as people move along and find good ideas, toss out what doesn't work, and adds in what does work. And Savage Worlds has that same thing going on because of its library of content made not just by the Savage Worlds team, but made by other folk. So that, I think, is the last idea I have for, for what Savage Worlds is up to now. There's a brand new edition coming out, basically, that, uh, that'll remove some of the more pre the, the, the 2003 kind of <laughs> stuff like 3.x was still out in 2003 christ exalted had only been out for like a year like like exalted mm -hmm. first edition yep so you know it's it's an older system for it to be running on that chassis definitely <clears throat> okay so what should we cover next? What do you have lined up, Peter? What um, do you want to talk about? What, what stood out to you? Um, well, it's a universal system, but for the types of games we like to play, it didn't seem to work out, unfortunately, because 
like half of the systems there, if not more, in the core book at least, are combat focused. Like you've got many pages devoted to little incremental additions to make combat slightly better on your end or what have you. That stood out. Um, there, there's a lot of like they they have feats, but they're called edges. Yeah. And you get them for <clears throat> leveling up basically from advancing, and. The edges, yeah, they felt very incremental, very small, like baby steppy as you went along, and they didn't really do that much compared to if you happen to be a character that took magic. Yeah. Like any of the supernatural stuff really started to, in our eyes, from what we saw in the two games, outshine uh, straight up like using a melee weapon. I mean, to some extent, you could. There are some edges where, like, oh, you get plus one to your weapon that you already have a D12 in, or the ones you become a noble. That's the same increment, right? Like, kind of lopsided, it seems. So. Yeah, it very much like... Like, I, I started with D&D 3.0. Right. That was kind of a, the game I ran really into, and I was having flashbacks of that kind of design. Like, the, the, the edges there felt very... Like, they yeah, they, they didn't scale right for what they were giving you. Like, oh, you're a noble. You're rich. And it's like, oh, is that worth getting an extra damage die to a weapon? I don't know. <laughs> What yeah. can I do with what? What does the system support for being a noble? Not really a lot outside of action. Okay. Well, like say, if you want to be a social character, your options are: you can be charismatic, which gives you plus two; you can be pretty, which gives you also plus two; you can be very pretty, which gives you plus two on top of that. Or you and could, that's uh, end. Or you could take an arcane focus and say the arcane focus is you being supernaturally charismatic and then just whammy them with magic. Yeah. Which I liked. I liked that it was very open-ended. Mm. Um, how Savage Worlds does its magic is that all of the, the rote sort of programs that would be magic are genericized. Like, there's the damage one, the healing one, the yeah. mind control one. And then you're supposed to alter their permissions and their fluff and little things about them for what your character does. Or for what the setting has if you want to, you know, pre-build a setting with a Savage Worlds conversion. Yeah. So, like... The thing I didn't like about leveling up at the edges is like you have two costs for thing. Either cost something costs one point or two points. And you get two points per level rank or whatever that's called. Yeah. And that's it. There's not enough granularity that like can compare it to say Chronicles of Darkness, where the costs range vary based on what you're getting out of it. And say if we're comparing edges including so that that would be comparing the, them to merits, which are varied. In Chronicles of Darkness, which have more flavor and more diversity, I would say. A lot more ideas for not combat stuff, which I personally felt that it was lacking in Savage Worlds. Like, I was playing a guy that wanted to be a healer in Ravenloft. There's one edge for that, and some like semi magical that you're better at healing, and that's it. Like, after our first season of playing in the Ravenloft, I was looking at all the edges I could get. I didn't want to go combat or whatever, and there was nothing I wanted to take anymore. Nothing that was interesting, which kind of sad. All the diversity. Yeah, I, I could definitely I mean, feel that. I even looked at Weird War and for uh, for my character background being from War, war and so on. And there wasn't that much there either. And it was similar in our Savage Rifts, where there also wasn't that much to take after you've done your core bits. Yeah, your character, once you do the core build, is basically done, and then there's little things you can do, and maybe a few neat, spiky tricks you can take. Like, the combats, like, every one of the iconic frameworks has a, a few edges devoted to them that make them more awesome. But yeah. after that, you're kind of done. Yeah, pretty much. Also, the magic and... Savage Rifts is just astoundingly good. It's it's a, it's really good. Yeah. To I don't want to say to its detriment because it's Rifts and you're supposed to kind of take it with a grain of mm -hmm. salt. But the comparison to Chronicles of Darkness is almost a little cruel because Savage Worlds came out in 2003 and the New World of Darkness Blue Book came out in 2004, and they were both like I remember the New World of Darkness core book, the Blue Book. Mm -hmm. It had a lot of problems. It had a lot of similar problems, actually, to Savage Worlds. Like, it was 
it was an it was an artifact of its time. And the Chronicles of Darkness book came out 2015, so there's a 15 year gap in technology between the two of them of just RPG design. Yeah. Well, but still, there's some comparison to be made there. Yeah, I agree. I totally agree. Um, but it, it does serve as a nice kind of almost uh, path you can kind of trace, like because they're doing that black edition, so. You can almost kind of see, well, this is what Savage Worlds has been for the past, like, 12 years. What's it going to look like when they re when they release Black? What are they going to shake up? What, what are the folks is going to lie? Yep. You know, a lot of these subsystems can kind of be rolled into one and changed. Like, the vehicle system and the chase mechanics for the vehicle system are very different from how the, the, the individual person system works. Yeah. Uh, and they're different from like the, the, the long form action system when you're like doing an investigation or you're like working together on a long term project. Yeah. I'm wondering if they couldn't kind of condense those down and maybe streamline those a bit. Yeah. Well, we'll see what the next edition yeah. goes. Well, maybe your listeners will see. I don't know whether we'll be looking into that. I'll probably check it out. There's no reason not to. Yeah. Um, what else? Um, we use the adventure cards for our Savage Worlds and Savage Rifts, and I liked them. Yeah, those were kind of interesting. Like, a lot of them were fun and spiced things up a little bit. Yeah, narrative control, random narrative control thingies that uh, you can just kind of play around with. Yeah. Although on the other hand, some of them are very specific. Like the the one that lets you damage an ally if you're betraying them. Yeah. <laughs> the backs of one or. If a character dies, everybody gets a card. Like, you know, some of those situations are like very rare if they ever come up. And since they're so rare, and the cards are, you know, one in 50, whatever chance, how often will we get both of them at the same time? It's like. I'd really prefer if there were some more generic, more upper ended cards, like have a set of like 50 of them, whatever, that are good up apply to say 90% of the games, each one of them. That would be really neat if that could happen. Or an option to um, save cards. Save cards or play around with them a little bit more. Um, yeah, but overall I think we liked it and we'll probably be using it for our other games even. Maybe we'll yeah, see. We, we might pick up the adventure cards. We might, we might find something similar to it. I'm sure there's an equivalent out there somewhere that it's just like the Savage Worlds adventure cards that we can just take. Yep. Uh, the Savage Worlds adventure cards are very different from the initiative system, which just uses playing cards. Just to clarify for the listeners. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, like for the initiative stuff, like it's a workable system, I suppose. It's not really that bad of it. Yeah, it's just. Playing cards, that's neat. It, it's definitely a holdover from Deadlands, it looks like. Yeah. There's not much to it. Um, but yeah, speaking of initiative, um, I sort of found that if you want to be planning something, like have some sort of combo you can try to execute in the game, I think there's only one large combo you can try to pull off, which is you know, to take. Um, you take your biggest weapon you're gonna have, you grab level headed, then improve level headed, and then a quick and dead shot. And that's the only combo I think that you can try to execute where you go through many cards in each turn trying to get the Joker, and only you get the Joker to try to murder someone. And that's. Well, that Joker uh, trick is brutal. Yeah, I mean, in normal game, you wouldn't be able to do that because. Well, for a long while, because some of those edges are high level, but for Tomorrow's Legion and Savage Rifts, you can take those high-end edges at the start of the game, which can be brutal. Yeah, yeah, you def can. Yeah, so, like, that seems to be the only strategy other than just hit things until they stop, you know, breathing and so on, so... Um, yeah, there's a definite, um... That's the word I'm looking for. The game is very much a combat game. Yep. So a lot of it is geared towards that. Yeah, and at least we had some problems balancing the combat, it seems. But that would be from experience. Yeah, I think if I knew a little bit more about the game, I would have had a better time with it. I should have... Uh, I probably should have 
switched up the action a bit more, but the, the, the Star Wars, the Star Trek game, or the Star Wars game had a very specific premise, so... I mean, even in Ravenloft, like, we didn't know that our technical guy suddenly became the murder hobo once they created Cuttle Prod, and that just ended everybody. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Magic. Uh, he took magic because he was a weird scientist inventor, and we thought he'd be able to, like, oh, I have a stun gun. And the stun gun did a billion damage. Yeah. Whoops. Suddenly... Sorry, we're back. We had to pause because of a thing. <laughs> so, yeah. Suddenly, our inventor guy became our murder guy. Yes, he did. And, yeah, it was kind of surprise balance there. And, yeah, with Savage Rift, it was kind of hard to balance someone that's like a Mars versus a Glitter Boy with a boom gun. I think the Mars and the, and the, the iconic frameworks within themselves balance pretty well. Mm. I think they really do. It's just there are other underlying complications you have to overcome that like certainly doesn't help, but it's not like that's the big problem. Yeah. Like you could build a Mars to be just as deadly, but like like Kevin did because his like, dog man, you know, couldn't take a punch, but his spider walker I think could outperform you. <laughs> so there was this weird moment where he was at the bottom of the pile and he was at the top. Again, the inventor yeah. character. Yeah. Magic. Yeah. <coughs> but yeah, take that, combine it with that, double the damage Joker play, and it's kind of hard to balance between doing 50 damage and suddenly bursting into 100 damage, like I pull up once. It's like, yeah. It was pretty good. That was pretty fun. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, if you want to have a fun ramp, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think that's generally most of the point we had about Savage is like, it feels a bit unsatisfying, especially for a Universal-esque system you want to have, unless... Well, that's kind of the problem with Universal systems in general. Mm. Like... Savage Worlds, I don't think, started as a universal system, and I, I could be wrong, and if I am, whoops. But I think Savage Worlds started as, like, Deadlands. Like, it started as a, as a game that did a thing, and it was, like, a punchy Wild West fight game. You know, where you're, you're, you know, dealing with bullshit, and you pull cards, and jokers are wild, and it's all very... It had its own themes going on. But when you pull that out of the system and try to, you know, say, oh, you could run other games in this, it's like, yeah, but those other games are going to be shaped like the game it was originally built for. You know, it's like D20. Every one of those fucking early 2000s D20 derivatives, you know, D20 Modern, D20 this, D20 Monty Cook's World of Darkness, which was D20. <laughs> fucking Lord. All of them were D&D shaped. And they couldn't escape it. Yep. You can't escape it. The system is built so that you're a group of co cooperative take people. And if you're, you're not playing people who take, the system's not going to do anything. That's one of the issues Godbound has, actually, that we've talked about, because we like Godbound, it's very fun. We like that it does Exalted a lot better for us than 3rd Edition was, but it has that D20 OSR legacy, and there's a very much a take legacy. Like, if you're not playing someone who's very action-y, and like, say you're playing a social character, it's mostly going to be role-playing. You're never going to have a lot of leverage to kind of engage in that same kind of back and forth, the way Chronicles of Darkness door system does, or even Exalted 3rd Edition's uh, uh, social maneuvering engine. Um, it's mostly just, hey, do what I say, and they're like, no, and you're like, all right, I'll, I'll roll a charisma check, and I'll do really well and succeed. Or it's like, oh, they still say no. It's like, I'll use my demon magic and make them accept. You know, it's, it's very yeah. one, two, three. Yep. And yeah, that's that's an issue inherent to D twenty because games that are built from it are shaped like D and D, uh, and that's still that's an issue with Savage Worlds. Um, I'd want to bring up GURPS, but I don't know enough about GURPS to make the comparison. Mm -hmm. um, I know I know that Palladium was a second edition D and D um, <laughs> homebrew, and it kind of shows. Open up any Palladium book, and it is a it is a combat fiesta. It is a take fiesta. You are takers in that game. 
Yeah. Takers by force. <laughs> Yeah, um, we'll be running a Chronicles of Darkness for the Ravenloft and see how that compares. Um, yeah. I guess other than that, we can only finish up the ideas we had with the Star Wars game. Give a little bit of closure for the game we won't finish. Oh yeah, the, the Rift versus the Star Wars. Yeah. So yeah, uh, the idea, much with our Star Trek Voyager game, which I'm, I'm sure is out by now. <laughs> oh my god. I think it's going to come out a year after we recorded it. We recorded it with Ian in August, and this session we're recording right now, like this episode might come out in August. Oh my god, they might not hear the Star Trek game until a year later. Oh, definitely, you're the worst. <laughs> yeah, I really dropped the ball. I, you know what I, I could do? I could, uh, instead, of, instead of us keeping doing Ravenloft, once Ravenloft is fully out, or season one, I can just do you know three weeks of track. Maybe I'll wait a year when Ian comes back, <laughs> once his kid's like a year old, and uh, and then we could wrap up season one. <laughs> Shit. Anyway, the game was very much similar to a premise to another game that we uh, filmed a year ago and you never saw because it's still in the queue to publish, in that we wanted to go through um, the Star <clears throat> Wars prequels because they're garbage and make them our own. Yep. Uh, so we did that with Riffs. And you, you listened to that, listeners, and it was amazing. Uh, it was dumb. Really dumb. Yeah. Um, so it was a big fanfiction.net crossover story where the Doom Marine and a comic book villain and a bunch of assholes all get together from Savage, from the Rift's Palladium world and then go to Star Wars and have a Star Wars. Yeah. We just wanted to do something dumb, so here it is. Yeah, I wanted to flush the dumb out, <laughs> and we definitely did that. Yeah. So we got together, we broke down each episode into five parts, and that's how we planned sort of everything in advance. Try to incorporate some of our ideas into it later on. Yeah, so where we, we changed it and ad libbed it as we went too, so where we left off, um, I think. Obi-Wan Kenobi was set on fire and left in a pit. Something like that. And the Clone Wars were dogmen. Yeah. And the the villain from Doom, Dr. Samuel Hayden, showed up once. Yeah. Um, so the idea was Dr. Samuel Hayden was using hell energy to cross portals, and that's how he ended up opening a portal to rifts, and that's why the Coalition had a portal room, because they were using hell energy and like Samuel Hayden tech to... like communicate across realities for the crossover. Yeah. And when you guys went to Star Wars, the, Hayden was able to communicate to the Star Wars universe and met the Emperor. Yeah. And the two of them were building the Death Star. The Death Star uses hell energy to kill planets. Ardent energy. Yeah, ardent energy. So it fires an ardent energy laser to blow up worlds because they're evil. Yeah. So this is how the third movie was going to go down. Obi-Wan Kenobi would have kidnapped... Palpatine, and he would be General Grievous, and his technology would be based off of Tyler's General Grievous character. So yeah. General Grievous is basically a combat cyborg from Rifts, and he's Obi-Wan Kenobi after being burned up and, and murdered all at that time. Yeah. Count Dooku is not in play here. Count Dooku got his head cut off. Yeah. Um, so that would happen, and then you'd have to track down Grievous and, uh, and kill him. Oh, no, no. Count Dooku was in play. Because uh, his body would be what was guarding Emperor Palpatine with a robot head. <laughs> because his body was evil. <laughs> and the robot head would be like an evil, like, red-eyed droid head. And it would talk just like Count Dooku. Twice the power, twice the fall. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, and after you dealt with that, I don't think anything interesting would happen. I mean, after that, we had, what, what well, the other general videos that would be actually seen. Then the Order 66 will happen in the nightfall. Oh, yeah, all the dog boys will start trying to murder you and yeah. the Jedi. Yeah, and all the, you know, pretend to fall from all the ships or whatever, and you suddenly have the... Yeah, 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 okay, so in uh, Attack of the Clones, if you watch the Trade Federation Army, they have those little goofy droids that have, like, a little happy face head with a little nose. They're called Dwarf Spider Mechs. 
So just, just imagine those opening up revealing skull walkers and like all the dog boys pulling like rubber off their helmets to reveal skull helmets and skull insignias coalition style. Yeah. And it'd be a goofy nightmare where the, the Empire, where it went from being the Republic Army to being the Empire with a bunch of fascist bullshit and skulls and death head stuff. Are we the baddies now? Yeah, full on space Nazi. <laughs> Yeah, they'll be... And then the Jedi would be killed in their giant green screen room. Yeah. And I guess Anakin... Wait, then we is go... Is evil? <laughs> well, then there'll be the Mustafar stuff where all the Trade Federation are there just for people to execute them in a nice, one convenient spot. I guess Anakin would be evil at this point. Probably. Maybe he could brag by the Emperor or something. He, he, yeah. he split his soul too much between too many horcruxes and became evil. <laughs> yeah, because the overarching idea for the series was that the Emperor was going through mercenaries until he found someone strong enough to whatever be his apprentice. Yeah, that's and, why Dark Maul was just a gangster. And also, he'd be pulling the technology from us and making yeah. copies and adapting our technology to the universe. Yeah, exactly. The Emperor was taking Rift's technology. That's why there was so little Mega Damage armor and Mega Damage weapons in the first two movies, because the Emperor was in the background absorbing it, because the universe didn't know how to deal with Rift's wacko tech. Yep. So when you went to fight the Emperor, because eventually you'd go and fight the Emperor. Or you'd fight Yoda, or you'd fight the Emperor. Probably Emperor. Yoda's probably a fucking frog. He's dead. It's not um, a problem. So it'd be like, you'd fight the Emperor, and there'd be three... I think I called them, like... Uh, like dark boys or black boys or whatever. Probably not black boys. Oh my god, I just heard that out loud. <laughs> Holy shit. Oh, uh, goth boys. I don't know. They'd goth. be yeah, Darth boys. <laughs> They'd be glitter boys, and there'd be like on life support, like Obi Wan Kenobi from the Grievous Body, Qui Gon Jinn, and so on, and maybe Dark Maul who you killed. And they'll be they'd be like sealed inside like a Warhammer forty K dreadnought on life support. And they'd be like, you'd fight three Glitter Boys and Emperor Palpatine as he's screaming, throwing Senate seats at you. Yeah. Which sounds awesome, right? But that also sounds like eight hours of a combat rule. Yeah. That doesn't sound fun. So, um, yeah. And then, I think at the same time, even though your character's fighting Palpatine, all of your characters will also be on Mustafar fighting Anakin. Or something. <laughs> yeah. Or something. It doesn't matter because, as we said, the game didn't matter. So it didn't matter if you guys were in a fight with Palpatine and also simultaneously across the galaxy in a fight with Anakin. And Mustafar would look like Mars. It would be a hell planet with hell portals. Yep. So there'd be there'd be Capo demons and Hell Knights, and you know it might not even be Anakin you're fighting. Anakin might be fighting with you with Palpatine, and yeah. the, the big boss at the end might have been um, what do you call it? The Cyber Demon. Could be. And Samuel Hayden. Samuel Hayden would show up with a. With the Cyber Demon. He fixed it. <laughs> and it, it'd be your ass. Yeah. Well, yeah. If one of the split out, it would work if we were running normal sessions. But since we were limited to one hour, we don't want a session where somebody doesn't play at all because they're in a different place. Yeah, that's shit. No one cares. Yeah. But yeah, we wanted to also incorporate some other parts of the setting. Like, oh, Papa Team talking about anything about the dreams would be with Siegfried because Siegfried was having nightmares. Or when the you know saying, oh no, the dark side has clouded our vision. It'll be, you know, Dr. Satan's magic clouding our vision because he got... My, my idea for the dark side clouding your vision was the, the Death Star and Mustafar, like the generators, the Argent generators were creating so much hell energy that it was like the warp for Warhammer 40k. And that's what was clouding the Jedi. There was a plant that was an open gateway to the warp over there. And that was fucking up the entire galaxy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fucking imps and caco demons spilling out. Yeah. I put on the doom music and you'd be like, I got this. I'm fine. Don't. Just leave me here. <laughs> yeah, this is my home. Yeah. It's like, also originally I had the idea that uh with the clone army, the main clone be the good boy, which would be the that main leader of the good boys from. Yeah, uh, that was an Dr. idea. I liked it being uh, Doctor War Crime, just because that's hilarious. Oh. oh, the thing is, like in our backstory, there was that oh, there was a pug sidekick that yeah. died. I think, oh, maybe he liked him so much that he wanted to clone him and bring him back. Although that will be a nice arc to that thing. But, eh, yeah. As it worked out, it was pretty good in the end. Now neither of us will be virgins. <laughs> Fucking uh, 
Christ, that line. Yeah. And, yeah, and uh, do you want to tell how the whole game would end? Oh, yeah. So at the very end of the game, when, when it was all said and done, you, like, you all got killed by the Emperor and blown up on Mustafar. It cut back <coughs> to the Star Wars Cantina and B. Arthur would be like, and that's it. You all caught fire and died. And you're like, no doubt, that's what happened. It's like, and then, the, and then just like in the end of the Star Wars uh, Life Day special, she'd be like, well, we all had our fun, but it's time to close. The Empire is shutting us down. And like fucking Tyler would be like, yeah, we know. That's why we're here. Like, that, the old unquote, that's why I'm here. <laughs> because you guys joined the Empire. The Emperor forgave you after the fight. And yeah. you're just, you're just jackbooted thugs now. <laughs> right in time for us to, to watch Solo, a solo story, and Rogue One. Yeah. And then, and then, and play through them. Kevin had never seen the prequels, listeners. He hasn't seen a single Star War. Yeah. So we, we made him watch the prequels. <laughs> it was astounding. Like, like you can't Im- imagine someone who's never seen the sky. That was his response to everything in those movies. Like we were talking about the the, the midichlorian scanner and how midichlorians exist and how they have a scanner for it. And he's like, "Is this something from Rift?" So I'm like, "No, no, no. This is in the movie." He's like, "What?" And then we saw the movies. Like they have a blood scanner to check if you have magic. Yeah. It's so stupid. Like, ah. Uh... For before I started playing, I decided to rewatch the prequels. Like, oh god, those things didn't age well. Like, there's so much bad in them. It's like, oh, so many people talking weird voices. And like, oh, where the gun guns? I guess we hang out here in this swamp after we got kicked out of the house. We did nothing here. No camps or anything. No, we just sit on statues. They're just, hang, they're just hanging out on statues out in the open. You get murdered. It's a secret place. Christ. Well, like when you actually start thinking, okay, what was the emperor's plan all along? He he started a war. He divided the thing in two. He was controlling both sides of the army. So he had twice the army he needed to win this war. But now he had to be elected as this emperor. Could have ended this war way earlier. No, Red Alert Media definitely did a, a thorough fucking job of this, but it still <coughs> makes no goddamn sense. Yeah. The worst part is, it gets worse the more Star Wars movies you see. Mm. Or, like, more movies you see in general. Yeah. Like, the prequels were incoherent. Like, just watch Attack of the Clones and Anakin just telling creepy shit to Obi-Wan. Like, oh, I've got feelings for her. Just yeah, like, Anakin talking about his little boy erections for Padme when he was eight. It's like, stop. Please stop talking to me, Anakin. I feel bad for Hayden Christensen. <laughs> or even little things like, oh, there's C-3PO and there's Anakin and Amidala coming in there. And he goes, oh, Queen Amidala. He never met that character. Never. <gasps> he never met that character. Ever. Well, he, he, yeah, because he, 3PO was on Tatooine. Yes. He met Padme and then was left behind. And then Mas Anakin and Queen Amida. <coughs> I, I, he never met her. Yep. He only, he never even met her like in the Phantom Menace. He was there briefly. He was like, oh my god, I have no skin. Yeah. Three P wasn't even in those two movies until after the the the, the kid slaughter. <laughs> Fuck. You're killing me. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought of that. Well, is there anything else, Pete? No, I think that wraps everything up. Yeah. So that's what we had planned for Rift versus the Savage Star Wars. Yeah, never gonna happen. <laughs> no, it's it's fine. We we were bored. <laughs> it was a very boring game. Yeah. You know what wasn't boring? Wager. We really started to pick up the pace as we we started fixing shit. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was a silly thing, good thing to have it out of the system. Yeah. It was spiraling out of control. Yeah, it's good that we got the silly out, so I stopped putting Decepticons in all the other games. Yeah, that's always fun with those Decepticons. The one. The one. 
and his goblets. His lice doesn't count as a Decepticon. I mean, don't it's a they? past. <laughs> it doesn't have his faction. That's like saying your tapeworm would be like a Nazi if you were a Nazi. That doesn't. <laughs> the property of transference doesn't work that way. Anyway, we were able to stretch that out to 40 full minutes. That's why I really stretched it out there with the Decepticons. So we got 40 minutes on the dot. <laughs> okay. Anyway, uh, Savage Worlds probably is very good for fast, fighty games. Um, and that seems like it's damning with faint praise. But I, I like... I like... It. <laughs> it's so hard to say, but I did. I liked it. It's just... It's like, you know, it's a little too... It shows its age. Yeah, for, personally, I prefer some of like Star Wars well, numbers, I suppose. Which is also, it's based on the same kind of older design, but it's also fast. Yeah. It doesn't waste my time. It's simple. You don't have to go like, okay, how do we do car chases? Could you imagine us doing GURPS? Uh, have you ever picked up a GURPS? I haven't picked up a GURPS. Or, yeah, fuck, man, I gotta show you fucking curves. Holy fuck. Anyway, sorry for ragging on Savage Worlds a little, but it was okay. Um, it clearly does its own thing. It's getting a new edition. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of really interesting things you can do with it that are out there right yeah. now. Uh, I would recommend checking out the Flash Gordon. Uh, let's see, the Ravenloft Savage World supplement is... I liked it. Oh, yeah. It's really well written, especially that half of it is the more in the universe aspect. Half of it is just, okay, guys, this is just like this. Yeah, the, no the, bullshit. The major strength of Raven yeah. Law Reincarnated, the, the Savage Worlds book for Raven Law, that's a free book that was written by Jay uh, Plunkett, um, is that it's it's mostly fluff. And it's a it's a solid introduction to Raven Law. Like, I've played Raven Law forever, and it is a, is a concise, strong, nuanced breakdown. And it tells you the, the the flavor and the fluff and the lore and the feelings of the game. And then another half, it speaks to you, the reader, and be like, "This is the picture of Dorian Gray world. This is Dracula world. This is this world." And it just yeah. moves you through it. Yeah, it doesn't pretend that it's like grandiose or in the universe or whatever. It's just like, okay, he, here are the facts. Here's all you need to know. Here's a one paragraph. Done. Yeah, and it was a very modern update too. I, I like that they, they they tackled some things and like. Uh, helped clarify issues from the uh, Sword and Sorcery and Second Edition era and like the shift arounds that happened and they expanded on some areas that didn't get a lot of love. Perfect. Yep. I think that's a nice positive note to end on. Yeah. So, I was Devin. And Peter. And this is sponsored by Nobody. Signing off.